and I'll introduce Don McLaughlin. Take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see all of you again. Today, I have the great pleasure of introducing one of my former colleagues, Dr. Jim Sane. Jim is a native of San Diego, California, and he is currently professor of music at the University of Florida, where he teaches acoustic and electroacoustic music composition, as well as music theory. Shortly after coming to UF, Jim founded the internationally acclaimed Florida Electroacoustic Music Festival in 1992, if I remember correctly. Yeah. As festival director for 17 years, Jim was responsible for programming over 1,600 works of contemporary art music. This important project helped bring international recognition to UF's School of Music. A highly respected composer, Dr. Sane has been guest composer in residence at music schools across the globe, including the Swedish Royal Academy of Music, the Folkwang Hochschule in Essen, Germany, the University of Rennes in Buenos Aires, Argentina, the University of Birmingham in England, and the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, as well as at many universities in the United States. He has also curated exchange concerts with Stanford University's Center for Computer Research and Music and with the Korean National University of the Arts in Seoul. His compositions have been featured at numerous conferences of professional music organizations, including the International Computer Music Association, College Music Society, the American Composers Alliance, the American Guild of Organists, the International Clarinet Association, and the World Saxophone Congress. Dr. Sane served on the American Composers Alliance Board of Governors, and he is President Emeritus of the Society of Composers, Inc. His compositions can be found on numerous prestigious CD labels, and his music is published by American Composers Editions and others. During his recent concert lecture tour of the United Kingdom, I understand that one of Jim's good friends informed him that his last name, Sane, means sound, and Welch, making him Dr. S Dr. Sound. Now, how cool is that? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Singh. Thank you so much, Don. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, I wanna certainly thank Don for the invitation. Um, it was a pleasure uh, to, uh, to be one of his colleagues for many years and for him to have been such a wonderful supporter of our program, specifically in composition and electronic music. Uh, it was just a, a wonderful uh, you know, collaboration that we had to move the program forward. Um, so it's, 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 I would like to approach today as a dialogue uh, rather than a lecture. Um, I have a PowerPoint that has a lot of information that I'm gonna share with you and a lot of options in, in, in bridges that I can take in various directions, depending upon uh, what you're interested in uh, regarding the music that I've made for the last 30 and 40 years. Um, so I'm going to spend just a second here and uh, work on sharing my screen um, for the uh, PowerPoint presentation. And we'll start with that. But I am open for questions as we go. I will try to save some time at the very end uh, to sort of wrap up and maybe uh, do some questions at the very end as well. Um, but there's there's plenty of material here to uh, take us on a journey, and I, I do hope that you'll um, enjoy uh, some of what sh which you hear and maybe uh, somewhat engaged by some of the music, and and it may ask uh, you may ask questions regarding um, what inspired some of these um, pieces. Dr. Um, Yes. If any come in through chat or raise their hand, do you want me to interrupt or kind of wait for a spot? Yeah, sure. Okay. sure. That would that would that would be wonderful. Um, right. I may not see them as quickly as you will. Yeah, yeah. happy to um, help. So that would be terrific. Um, you know, the uh, presentation is titled "An Eclectic Teleological Discourse." Um, we do, uh, you know, need to put some historic. Uh, information before that. A um, little bit of pictures of some of my very, very eclectic background um, from 
doing street recordings in Argentina and on the what they call the sub T, which is the uh, the oldest uh, running uh, subway in South America. Um, they have the original cars, as you can see there in, in that picture, um, as well as doing exchange concerts and interviewing Philip Glass. And I was actually on the radio uh, as a graduate student on uh, public radio in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh, so I've done a lot of different things in my life that sort of has informed uh, my music and has inspired me to write certain pieces. What do I mean by a, 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 an eclectic teleological discourse? Um, I, I like the, uh, um, the third um, definition for teleology, uh, a belief in or perception of purposeful development toward an end. Um, eclectic meaning made up of combining elements from a variety of sources. And then, of course, a discourse being a verbal exchange or conversation. So that's what I'm hoping to inspire here is uh, more of a conversation than a lecture. I've heard myself speak far too many times, and uh, I would prefer to have a conversation than to, to listen to just my point of view. One of my favorite cartoons, um, little known fact that it took Brahms over seven years to complete his lullaby. Um, <laughs> um, I was just feeling I, I, I've been up for a while today and I thought maybe the nap would be appropriate, but probably not until after this. What is a composer? A composer is one that composes, especially one who composes music. And then uh, a nice quote from Addison, if the thoughts of such authors have nothing in them, they at least show an honest industry and a good intention in the composer. So we, we, we take sounds, um, whether from instruments or voice, or even from recordings of uh, the world, and we arrange them in such a way that we call them compositions. Okay, a little bit about me, um, as and I'm trying to I'm trying to make it as little as possible. Um, my original background is as a classically trained uh, flautist. Uh, I studied with Frederick Baker, who was the first flautist of the San Diego Symphony for over 10 years when I was a young person. And I give Fred um, great credit for my foundation as a musician. Um, first exposure to theory was as, as a senior in high school. My band director decided he'd offer a theory course. We got out the Piston Harmony book and we went at it. Um, my first composition was actually composed as part of that series of classes. Um, my last semester in high school, I composed a work for a jazz band, um, which was literally the first thing that I wrote originally. Um, I began my formal composition studies as an undergraduate, um, and I was a, a music education uh, major when I started uh, school. Um, my mother didn't understand what I would do as a musician, but she could understand what a teacher was. I come from a family of of educators. My mother and my aunt were both educators in both elementary, and then my mother also taught life sciences in middle school. So the idea of being a teacher uh, was something that was familiar to her, and uh, so uh, that was my first path. Um, I then changed to composition um, as I started taking some of the skills courses and private lessons with the professors at San Diego State University where I did my undergraduate and my master's degree. I also studied jazz saxophone when I was working on my master's in composition and uh, played in the big band. Um, I studied composition with uh, David Ward Steinman, Merle Hogue, Brent Dutton, and Frederick Gosen, as well as computer music with one of the pioneers in computer music, Hubert S. Howe. Um, I may refer to him as Tuck uh, from time to time if I'm, if I'm talking about this because his middle name is Shatuck and he goes by the nickname Tuck. Um, and one of the few uh, teachers that is still around, um, uh, many of my teachers have passed already and it's great to have Tuck still as sort of a mentor and I can uh, often contact him and throw some ideas in front of him. Um, I did found the electroacoustic music program at the University of Florida 
gosh, uh, 31 years ago. <laughs> it seems like yesterday sometimes, but in 1991, when I was hired here on a one-year position, um, I held that one-year position for two years, and then I uh, was awarded the tenure track line and uh, went forward there. Uh, I directed the F Florida Electroacoustic Music Festival from 1992 to 2008 and uh, became head of composition and theory for a few years there. Um, you can see uh, the, the years there from 98 to 2003, co-chair from 2003 to 2008. And I handed it off at that point happily um, <laughs> uh, so that I could uh, focus on other things than, than uh, the administrative. I give people like uh, Don great credit for spending all the time that they have in the administrative um, realm, and uh, I'm very happy for those that will do that. Uh, I was elected uh, chair of the Society of Composers Executive Committee uh, in 2003, which I was the chair of for 10 years, and then in uh, 13, I was elected president and served for the term of 13 to 17, um, and I'm now the emeritus, uh, one of the emeritus uh, professors, uh, or um, presidents, of the Society of Composers. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I don't, I don't expect you to read all of that, but that's just sort of a listing of some of the works um, from the most recent literally unperformed piece, um, uh, which is a piece for soprano and piano um, as part of a series by, um, on, based on works by um, Robert Frost. Um, which was wonderful to uh, find out a few years ago that a majority of his uh, poems became public domain. So that meant that we could use them without having to try to find a release from the publisher or the family. Um, so a lot of stuff there, and I'll talk a little bit more about the music. Um, as I said, my influence uh, includes jazz. Um, I was a classical flautist, um, that really loved jazz and didn't know how to express myself in that manner, um, since there were very few uh, jazz flautists um, at the time. There's certainly more now, um, but I sort of fell in love with the music of Herbie Mann and the, uh, um, the you know, Frank West and, and all the great, uh, Youssef Latif, all the great uh, flautists, jazz flautists, most of whom started as, a, as saxophonists. Um, so I was coming sort of from the opposite direction. And so much of that uh, influenced my writing. Um, the jazz flute sonata that's listed there, uh, I wrote um, when I was an undergrad, just as an example of how much that still influenced me. Um, the piano sonata I have listed there is um, a work that I wrote as a doctoral student. And I thought maybe we'd listen to just a, a little bit of the third movement. All right, so that's just a little bit of uh, a piece written probably, I think it was 30, 30 plus years ago, 32, 33 years ago, uh, for a fantastic pianist, uh, Rich Bosworth, who was on the faculty at the University of Alabama. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as a composer, we write for a number of uh, ensembles and solo instruments. And so, as you can see here, there's a a good number of uh, works for solo instruments um, that I uh, have written. And um, 
as an interesting aside, these syllogisms, I always think of zygote as sort of syllogism number zero, uh, the precursor to the syllogism series. Um, at the time, I had a colleague uh, by the name of Candace Brooks, and Candace uh, was a wonderful and supportive colleague. I wrote several pieces for her, actually three, I think. Um, and this being the first one, um, I was writing it in about the time I was getting ready to, to finish the piece, I found out that my wife was pregnant with our first child, Elizabeth, who is now uh, almost 27 and, and married and living in Seattle. Um, but uh, hence the name came up with Zygote um, for that. Uh, Candace also found out shortly after I gave her the piece that uh, she was also expecting her first child, Kaylee uh, Brooks. And um, so it, the piece sort of uh, became known as a fertility piece. Um, <laughs> it, it seemed that anybody associated with it became pregnant um, fairly, uh, you know, uh, shortly after. So uh, a little bit about, you know, the piece is for a solo soprano saxophone, um, and it uses a, a number of extended techniques, um, specifically key slaps and, and various multiphonics. So it's not necessarily uh, in a familiar musical uh, vein where you might hear uh, a, a, a melody and a, an accompaniment. Uh, this is for solo soprano saxophone. So let's just listen to maybe a, a minute or two of this. Uh, again, if you have a question specifically about the piece while it's going through, please speak up. I'd be more than happy to uh, to uh, do that at the at this time, or uh, I can I can field those questions at the end. About zigots, Wikipedia said a zigot is an acaryotic cell formed by a fertilization event between two gametes. The zygote genome is a combination of the DNA in each gamete and contains all of the genetic information necessary to form a new individual. In multicellular organisms, the zygote is the earliest development stage. In single-cell organisms, the zygote can divide asexually by mitosis to produce identical of spring. Well, I have a good thing here. The funny thing is, before that, zygote makes me think of the slang Swiss word, zigoto. Hey, man, you're a zigoto, which means a weird, but funny and intriguing man. And that was uh, actually performed by Laurent Estapé, who is a Swiss uh, saxophonist. Um, he loves to do these uh, recorded intros, which, which I think are uh, very engaging for the audience. Um, I met him uh, when he was here visiting with uh, another saxophonist, uh, Stephen um, uh, Stustek, who is the professor of saxophone at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, they were coming as a duo to work with um, our students. I've known Stephen for almost 20 years now. And he had this duo and, and brought it and worked with the students. And I was, uh, you know, talking with uh, Laurent. He said, yeah, I'd love to do a work of yours. So that we, we, we made the connection there. All right, computer music. Um, 
my background is historically and heavily in acoustic writing. Um, and it wasn't until I was a doctoral student and I met a man by the name of Hubert Howe that I sort of put the musical world and the computer world together. Um, it was, uh, I was writing large orchestral works, band works, you know, sonatas. And I had had electronic music uh, up until my doctoral work. It, it, it was mostly working with recording uh, devices and uh, hardware synthesizers and splicing and cutting of tape. And that didn't really interest me a whole lot. But I'd always had a great interest in technology. Matter of fact, between uh, during my master's degree, I worked as a computer technician working with, eight, with uh, HP 1000 and 3000 computers. Um, a friend of mine who uh, was uh, working for a computer company in San Diego said, hey, Jim, you, you want a part-time job? And I said, uh, you know, I don't have a degree in computer science like he had. And he said, oh, no, you got the background. I, I'd always sort of done electronics and soldered. And, you know, I took an electronic class in, in high school and I built a radio. And, and uh, matter of fact, now I'm a, a, a general licensed uh, ham radio operator. Um, so I've always had an interest in the technology, but the, the music and the technology didn't come together until I met Hubert Howe. And uh, the idea that you could create literally any sound that you could imagine using the computer was uh, very intriguing to me. And so um, I wrote a good number of pieces early on that were sort of explorations and some of the ideas and, and, and such that I was uh, pulled from um, acoustic music, um, one of which was a, a piece called Alleluia, which is based on, on a mode six plain chant from the Liber Usualis, uh, Liber Usualis which is the, uh, the book of the ordinary for the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and I found this Alleluia in there, um, and you can sort of see it grayed off in the back of that score. Um, and that's the foundation for this whole piece is this uh, modal chant um, upon which I have then applied free counterpoint, both in the vocal synthesis side and in um, the actual harmonics uh, in sine waves above it. So it's a fairly simple idea um, that utilized some of my interests um, in acoustic music and in, in writing for voice. And my, my dissertation was a requiem mass. Um, so I did a lot of studying in 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 uh, in the religious studies department and in Latin, and uh, so out of all of that stuff that was going through my head, came uh, some of these ideas. So this is just a little bit of Alleluia. Just, just a little bit about that. Um, very primitive computer work. Um, we were using a Sperry Univac D77 mini computer, which was about the size of four refrigerators put side by side <laughs> to do that. Um, our hard disk was only able to handle two minutes worth of 44.1 audio, which is what you get on a CD. 
And so there were limitations. Um, and I had done some research. Uh, Dr. Howe had given me uh, a listing of what is known as the formant values for the vowels that he had been given by Bob Moog um, of the Moog synthesizer fame. Um, but it was only a couple of the vowel formants. And I went off and, and researched in the library and found that there was a lot of linguistic research done and spectrograms that I could pull off those formant values and, and get literally uh, any, um, any vowel or consonant or what have you uh, formant values from those analyses. And I wrote them all up and I gave them to, uh, to Dr. Howe and he was, where'd you get this? <laughs> and I said, I just, you know, I went to the library and I was able to extract that from another field of endeavor. Again, sort of a, an ongoing theme here is this eclecticism and, and drawing from um, a variety of interests in my life. Um, so that was uh, an early example of um, electroacoustic music in my catalog. All right, works for duos. Um, and I, I, I don't often refer to these works as sonatas for saxophone or sonata for oboe um, because it really does require both players to be collaborative and to be equal uh, in making of the music. Um, it is not a, uh, a music where the pianist is accompanying the soloist like you often hear, whether it's Mozart or Beethoven or what have you. Um, the, the pianist is sometimes somewhat a secondary role, sort of harmonically and rhythmically supporting the soloist. Uh, these works really do involve um, both players as equal partners. Um, so the a little bit I'll share, of, uh, share with you of dystopia. Um, you may be familiar with the word, you may not. Um, dystopia is the opposite of utopia. Um, and you often will hear in science fiction uh, work uh, that, that they are based in, in often dystopic uh, environments. Um, so the, the, that is uh, sort of a, a descriptor. Um, I will say uh, this was written for, for Candace Brooks and uh, then piano colleague, uh, Patty uh, Dinkins Matthews. Um, and one thing she said, and I, I think I'll play the, the third movement as well, of this, she, she, I asked each player, you know, what are the things that you do and you do well? Because that's part of my job as a composer is to make the performers look as good as possible and enjoy what they're playing. And so one of the things that Patty said was, I like to play scales. <laughs> and so the idea of making a, a very scalar, very linear uh, movement out of movement three uh, is what you know came to the fore. Um, and you can you can see there uh, a, a review that was um, uh, unfortunately Borders Music no longer exists. Um, I actually own seven of their bookcases in my library. When they went out of business, I went over and bought them when they were selling all the furniture from the bookstore here in town. Um, but uh, I, I, I was uh, extremely um, humbled by their uh, likening this to Hindemith and Irving Fine, two amazing composers. And I, and I do have a great love for the music of Hindemith. So here is a little bit of dystopia. <laughs> on like that for a while. So a lot of scales, a lot of fast playing and, and rarely a break. Um, 
So that uh, Patty got her wish on that piece. And all right. Um, this uh, this work is inspired by my thoughts that I often share with my composition students. And one of them that I believe in wholly um, as, a, as a composer of pure music. Um, and that means that not, I do write programmatic music from time to time. I have written for TV, I've written for a number of uh, different resources, but in general, my music is music for music's sake. And I tell them that in my quest to develop material, I try to use minimum material, minimum material, but I use maximum development. The idea is to explore as much of what an idea, musical idea might have sort of in, in buried or embedded within uh, that specific insipid or germ of an idea. Um, this piece is called Declamation. Um, again, it was written for my uh, pianist friend from the University of Alabama. Um, and the piece is based off the first measure to the first uh, declamation of the theme. Everything else comes from it. Um, I often encourage my students uh, when we have assignments, I say, you know, use X or Y but I want you to be able to identify for me where everything has come from, how it has been developed. Um, that way we can build a very tight um, compositional work that, where things flow. So it's, it's like having the, the Beethoven Fifth Symphony. You know, we know that, that, that um, you know, da 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 da, the major third, you know, that entire movement of that Fifth Symphony is, is just comes from that germ. It, 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 it's expanded, it's, it's, it's you know, um, developed throughout the entire movement. Um, and that, you know, Beethoven has always been a fan of, uh, you know, one, one of my uh, models, role models. I have a picture of him above my grand piano in the piano room. Um, and I often hope that he will give me inspiration <laughs> to write better. So this is a little bit, this has uh, what they call a, a scrolling score. So you can actually, for those of you that might read music, you can actually follow along with uh, the score. take a breath here if anybody has a quick question or I can go on and continue down the road. All right, more music. That's great. So um, as Don mentioned, um, one of my early 
goals at the University of Florida was to build the electroacoustic music studio and start that program. Um, and with that came some, some wonderful opportunities to collaborate with other programs throughout the world. Um, and I've been very fortunate to travel um, and represent the, the University of Florida in many of the world's centers for computer music. Um, the picture there depicts uh, a concert that we did with Stanford University's uh, Center for Research in Music and Acoustics, um, which was founded by um, the, the uh, inventor of the, the DX7 synthesizer, John Chowning. Um, he was able to work out a methodology of using frequency modulation to generate complex musical tones. And it's amazing how he was able to get uh, wonderful, uh, both acoustic modeled types of sounds, as well as other sounds that may not have existed previously from the use of about six sine wave oscillators. Um, that was uh, the start of the program at, at uh, CCRMA. So from those early uh, pioneers like John and, and Tuck Howe and Max Matthews, um, who was a researcher at Bell Labs that found it actually came up with the first musical synthesis language called Music One. Music One led to its predecessors, Music Two, Music Three, Music Four. Music 4B, which was used at Princeton, um, my teacher, Hubert Howe, uh, came up with Music 4BF, which became the first transportable synthesis language, meant that if you had a computer that ran a Fortran compiler, you could run that language. And that was the first time that could ever be done. Up until that point, they were machine-specific subroutines that generated the sounds. Um, so it was a, a, an earth shattering change when all of a sudden you could go to any computer. Now we use um, a, a, a language called C sound, which is in the lineage of the music uh, one through you know, five um, languages. Uh, it's based on that same structure, um, and, but it's in the C operating system. So, or, or the C um, computer language, um, programming language. Uh, so that also meant uh, for, for me and for many others that we not only had to learn how to use computers, but we learned how, learned how to compose and, and to uh, program them in these languages. So I learned Fortran and I learned C in order to um, be able to get the computer to make the music. Um, one of the things that I was very interested in and was sort of a thing of my generation was the use of samples, um, taking uh, sounds from the world. It's, it's not, wasn't completely new. Some of the earliest electronic music came from France that used uh, the sounds of trains. For instance, Pierre Schaeffer and Pierre Henry uh, made their music from the chemin de fer, the, the, the train. Um, so that sort of, was an inspiration for uh, my generation to go from the synthesis, which was more of a German thing, to the actual uh, use of samples, the music concrete uh, of the French, and then take that into the computer side of things and manipulate them. Um, often where I would go, I was enamored with the sounds of the transportation systems along the lines of the, of the, the train sounds from the uh, Pierre Schaeffer. But for me, it was the subways. And so as I went in residence in Stockholm or in Buenos Aires or in, in, in Seoul, Korea, I always brought a recording uh, device, whether it was a, a tape recording early on, it was DAT recording, and then it became you know, with the, with the uh, flash media recorders. Um, so I'd probably uh, start out here and, and, and share with you just a little bit of a piece uh, called Togtil, um, which in Swedish means the train to somewhere. We're not sure where it's going. And so these, these sounds come from the Stockholm underground. <laughs> Thank you. 
bit of that. I uh, see so we have uh, Richard has a question. So I'm having trouble distinguishing, especially uh, those particular sounds um, from music and noise. Uh -huh. um, you know, to me, clearly the subway system um, has both noise and music. Right. Um, and I, I'm just having uh, a bit of a time with uh, differentiating uh, uh, by definition uh, between these two uh, because they may uh, uh, exist together or they, um, uh, I keep thinking of uh, compositions of music uh, as music, not sound. But clearly, you could uh, hear from the train sounds, uh, both noise and music, there was some undertones of different variations. Um, in the, um, but please enlighten me of the difference, the technical difference between music and, sound, uh, and just noise. OK. Uh well, first of all, I think I think it has a lot to do with vocabulary and the way we treat those two words, uh, music and noise. Um, I, I I personally have the opinion that noise is a part of music. Uh, we'll, we see that often in many instruments that are uh, that have aperiodic sounds, uh, such as uh, uh, non-pitched percussion. Um, which can very easily make a very cacophonous sound without any um, melody or harmony. Um, so it, 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 it has a lot to do with one's um, point of departure and familiarity with the sound world that, that we're working in. Um, yes, I agree with you that we have both sort of pitched elements and noise elements within uh, a piece like Togtil, which which is embracing that which was naturally present in the subway. Um, so um, I, 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 I actually wrote a paper uh, many, many years ago, ago called uh, Towards a Familiar Noise, and that I dealt with that specific idea um, that noise can be uh, used as a word that describes something very beautiful rather than something that is that is negative. Um, as I often joke with students, I say we have two types of music, good and bad. Um, and it's really, you know, what we use to create that music can be a, any number of things. Um, there's a very famous work um, by uh, Yorgi Ligeti, a, 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 a composer of the 20th century, who uh, wrote for 100 metronomes. 
um, set at different tempi and they just start off and it creates this wonderful cacophony of rhythms that sometimes come in alignment, sometimes don't. We get what we call additive and subtractive uh, you know, dip, uh, interference. So when they line up, you get a louder sound. When they don't, you sort of remove from the mass. And um, this piece can, we did it at the University of Florida. Um, our uh, student uh, composers group Actually, there's a company that rents hundred this this collection of a hundred metronomes, and and they uh, were able to rent these metronomes and did several performances over a week of uh, Ligeti's uh, piece on campus. One of which was in the Bauman Center um, with all that great reverb and um, and it just as the spring winds winds down on those old mechanical metronomes, the piece comes to an end and. Each, each time that piece is played, it will be some something different. And it is certainly embracing the idea of noise being a musical gesture. So we're all on these journeys at different, this musical journey in different spaces and different places with different mindsets. And I really applaud you for being open to hearing, you know, that sort of combination as being musical. All right, do we have anything additional? Thanks, Richard. Um, okay, uh, a little bit uh, about a brief view of eternity. Um, these pieces are for larger ensembles, um, more conventional ensembles. Um, Mitch Estrin asked me if I would write a piece for a uh, clarinet choir. Um, and I know Don's a, a, you know, a clarinetist uh, and, uh, the the one thing that we may disagree on is that historically a lot of the clarinet choir literature has been pulled from other ensemble uh you know works uh classical and, and otherwise and to some extent in that environment to me it sounds a lot like an accordion a really big accordion and so one of the things I tried to do with this piece is try to not make the clarinet choir sound like a big accordion. Um, the idea comes from a story. This is sort of programmatic. As I said, I don't write a lot of programmatic work, but this one is certainly uh, one that came from a story that my maternal grandmother told me. Um, she was born in 1906. Um, and was a young girl when uh, World War II hit. And she used to go down, she lived in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and she used to go down to the docks and watch the ships come in. And they were coming back from World War I with the soldiers on board. And unfortunately, many of them were wounded, some of which were carried off in baskets. And there was always a band on the docks welcoming the, the young men home, often playing various hymn tunes. And the one that stuck in her mind for the rest of her life as she was seeing these wounded soldiers being brought off the boat was near my God to thee. And to the day she died, she could not hear that tune without crying because the memories of that horrendous uh, event and the results thereof came back to her. So this piece is, is in, in a very direct way, but also often undertoned with the hymn to near my God to thee. So I just play a little bit of the opening, which is, is very much um, like a chorale.
Just a little bit of that. Um, believe it or not, the tune Near My God to Thee is the foundation of that entire movement. Um, not so obviously at first. It comes in a little more uh, obvious as we move on. Um, I'm going to go through some of this a little bit more quickly. Um, I worked also in the development of alternative controllers. We had one of the first in the world programs that was experimenting in dance control of electroacoustic sound. And I worked with my colleague, uh, Rick Rose. Unfortunately, Rick uh, has passed away since then. And um, we came up with a number of really interesting um, ways of taking the movement of the dancer and translating that to sound via the synthesizer. Um, I'll play just a little bit of the beginning of Ender's Game. All the sound in this video, and I apologize for the video quality. This is literally almost 30 years ago. Uh, we did this very early on in my, my time at the University of Florida. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a bad you know, transfer of a VHS tape. And, uh, but I think it'll give you an idea. Every bit of the sound being generated is from his movement. Everything that you were hearing was generated by his movement. And we found just like practicing an instrument, the more he used that interface and that suit, the better the performance became. So it's just a re reinforcement to all our students. You got to go out there and practice. <laughs> it's like Gary Langford says when he talks to his students, go and practice because it's important. Um, so we did alternative controllers and uh, also hyper instruments, which are using, you see that's a, a picture of a very young me uh, with the Yamaha uh, WX7 controller, which is based upon uh, the BEM woodwind system. Um, and you could use that as well to control a number of things. I even used it to control CD-ROM drives, which was kind of fun as opposed to just controlling it and producing uh, pitches and rhythms. Uh, scattered voices. We'll probably just uh, pass on this. This, this. I didn't know what I would would do, and 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 we all remember the horrid uh, days of 9/11. Um, when that was happening, I went and I mined the internet for sounds and quotes and everything I could do about what I knew that was an important event. And so I ended up taking all of those recordings melding them with recordings from other historic events and writing it as an homage to people that you know have passed due to these horrific uh, events. I also have a version that I did um, in collaboration with a local poet, Lola Haskins, and she has a poem that uh, when we do it together is read as part of the piece, um, which is called Seven Turtles. Um, so, uh, and he, she wrote that, that, that poem uh, like what I was doing with mining the, the sounds uh, from the internet. Uh, she wrote the poem the day that 9-11 that, uh, happened. So it, it, it was um, a way, and it took me over a year to know what I was gonna do with those sounds. And I talked to Lola and I said, you know, do you have anything? She said, oh yeah, I did the same thing. I, 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 I had to get my, um, my emotions um, and work with them through the art. Um, that's the wonderful thing about artists is that we have an outlet for much of our emotion in our artwork. Um, so uh, this, this piece is, is really, really deserves a, a large uh, space and, and a good sound system. So I'm gonna just kind of mention that and move on. Um, these are additional fixed media works like the uh, work you heard, Tog Teal. Um, we have tubular, which was based upon the BART system in San Francisco, Coriolis effect, which is the Subte in Buenos Aires 
of Bandegi, um, which is uh, the Seoul Metropolitan Subway, uh, Redbird Express, um, which is the number seven line. Um, for those of you that might have visited in New York, the, the Redbird, as they called it, because the uh, cars used to be all red. Um, all of those there are based upon sounds uh, of subways, um, and many of them uh, were commissioned. Uh, Coriolis effect was commissioned by the um, festival um, in uh, Buenos Aires that I used to go to. Uh, Bandegi was, was a piece that was written for the Korean National University of Arts, uh, and the Redbird was a commission from the New York City Electroacoustic Music Festival, which actually took over um, right when we uh, retired the Florida Electroacoustic Music Festival. My, my teacher, Tuck Howe, started the NYC uh, EMF um, as sort of the continuation. I was on the board that started that. Um, and then a piece uh, which is in the vein uh, of that, um, in that it is a fixed media work that comes from samples, but that one, Subjacent Q, was written uh, in homage to, um, um, you know, the um, um, famous uh, upright um, jazz bass player, and his name's going off, the, off my mind right now, um, Mingus, Charles Mingus. Um, so it has some, some some uh, quotes from Mingus tunes and things in it. Um, you also might look at the um, the picture there. That is actually uh, us setting up uh, the sound system for one of our electroacoustic music concerts uh, called Unbalanced Connection. Uh, we have a, a, a large speaker array system with a 48 channel mixing board. And we actually perform the pieces over the speaker array through the mixing board. So it's, it has an element of live performance in as well. Um, that's part of the history of, of and, and practice of electroacoustic music. Um, I did a, a micro opera for electroacoustic music and soprano. Um, we did it several times, uh, one of which was at the, uh, the Rev. Um, I have a work for soprano saxophone and interactive system. I'll play a little bit of ball peen hammer i'm trying to watch my time so we've got some some uh, question time um i think we're going good on that so this is um kristen stoner who is our flute professor and i this is i think the first time i did it on stage uh, most of the times i've done this piece and it's existed in a number of technological uh, varieties um, i did it originally with uh, game controllers uh, that you would use to like do a flight simulator and, and things of that nature, uh, which then sort of morphed over several iterations onto using an iPad as the controller. So you're seeing the iPad version here. So I'm actually playing back some pre-recorded samples and I'm also recording uh, Dr. Stoner live and manipulating her sound and then playing it back. Um, so there's a, a number of, of live processing elements that are going on in this, this piece. Um, and there's a backstory to the whole piece I can share with you if, if, if there's interest later.
right? The, the, and the piece, because it has the live element, is, again, different each time we play it. Um, I wrote out a, a, a potential score um, for this work um, for the electronics uh, performer to do. And I think I tried to play it once that way. Um, and then I just, again, I, I, with my jazz background, I thought that the improvisation side of things was a little more interesting than perhaps the, the set um, score. So uh, that was Ball Peen Hammer. Um, Endopsychosis um, is a piece that I wrote a few years ago um, as I was dealing with both my mother and my aunt having to be uh, cared for in uh, an Alzheimer's memory unit. Um, each section of this piece uh, is based upon some presentation of the Alzheimer's disease. Um, it is founded on a number of what we call hexachords or six note chords. There are 12 of them within the entire set. There are three sections to the piece in a coda. At the end of each section, a chorale presentation of those hexachords is made. Um, so you get four at the end of the first section, then second four at the end of the second section, and the last four at the end of the third section, and then a codetta with the final presentation of all six um, hexachords being presented as a chorale in the very end. Um, it helped me sort of get through the transition for me and in, in, from being uh, a son that was cared for by his mother to being a, a child that was caring for his mother um, at the end of her life. So um, kind of an emotional piece for me to uh, deal with. And um, this was commissioned by the University of Iowa uh, Center for New Music. Uh, I'm sure Don is very familiar with uh, that institution. It is literally the only Center for New Music that was started with uh, those Rockefeller grants that is in, still in, in existence. Uh, David Gomper is the uh, head of that. David and I know each other very well um, because uh, we both went to San Diego State and we sort of overlapped for maybe a year or so when we did our undergraduate there. David is now the head of composition for, at the University of Iowa. Um, I'd sort of like to maybe start this off and then move it toward the end so you can hear that, that last 12 um, hexachord presentation. Um, so I'm just gonna start here and we'll, we'll move We'll move a little further down. Um, this is written for Sinfonietta, which is a, a small orchestral uh, instrumental type ensemble. And uh, we'll just sort of start it maybe there. <laughs>
All right. Um, and just because I wanted to wanted to hear it, uh, this, these are actually the, if you can read music again, these are the uh, hexachords for that. Um, I started out writing secundal uh, clusters um, that moved away from each other uh, by the chromatic scale. That's why you hear that sort of chromatic scale mo motion in the outer voices. Um, you'll note also, though, if you look really carefully, there's a couple of them that have thirds in them. <laughs> um, I, I really wanted to, to, the idea was to stay with the secundal harmonies, but when I got back to it and used my composer's ear, I decided that I made a couple of changes. There's a few that have uh, some thirds in them. Um, so that was the idea of that piece. Um, and um, I think we'll move on. Uh, I've got a couple of newer pieces. Um, Pole Star is for clarinet and piano. That's been done quite a bit. Um, it was also done at the feature concert at the University of Iowa uh, when I was there. Um, and if you'd like to, to see it, um, I, can, I, I will give you my website address at the end of this presentation. And you can go under videos and, and actually, you know, see the whole thing. Um, most, uh, many of these, I won't say maybe not most. Some of the electronic music is not on there, but most of the acoustic works are on my website. Um, so that is, and there's there's a there's a structural reason for that. Um, I really don't want people performing my music from MP3s, and that's what you can really use on a website because of download speeds. And so the electronic music is a, is a really high quality recording. And so I sort of, I hold on to those for distribution to those places that would like to perform the music. Um, Firebreak is a work that just came out um, on, uh, in the last year on two uh, albums. The commissioning pianist, uh, Mary Hellman, has it on Centaur and um, Jeffrey Jacobs also has it out there, you can get it on Amazon, you can get it on Apple Music and all that sort of stuff. Um, it is a jazz influenced piece, talk about the eclecticism, I'm always coming back to improvisation or, or jazz. Um, uh, it is based upon that chord that you see there, the B minor seven flat nine sharp 11 um, chord. And um, the whole piece is based upon that. Um, and this swung eighth idea uh, with that B flat uh, that starts the piece. Um, there are uh, multiple sections. Each section of the piece is based upon a different foundational pitch. So we start out with B flat and then we'll go to another one of the, the um, uh, six notes. There is one that is omitted and I'm just gonna leave that as a, as a challenge if somebody wants to go and figure out which of the notes I omitted on that piece. Um, and to give us a little bit of time to do something that's really new. Again, you can, you can, you can find this out there um, on, on the uh, ether, um, either through Amazon or, or what have you. Um, I'm gonna go to the brand new piece that was literally premiered last Tuesday, a week, a week ago today, and um, by the Red Clay Saxophone Quartet, probably one of the best saxophone quartets we've got here in the United States, certainly one of the best in the world. Um, and um, we'll go to, to this piece, which is called Hedera. If we have any uh, um, folks that are into gardening, uh, they'll know that Hedera is the genus for ivy. And so each of the three movements is based uh, on a different type of ivy. It's needlepoint, English ivy, and poison ivy are the three that I use. I think there's 15-ish total um, forms of ivy. And uh, we'll start just at the beginning here. And um, each movement, again, is based upon a limited amount of pitches. Um, the first movement is based upon uh, the two chords. Uh, we have one chord presented twice, and then a small line, and then a second chord presented twice. And the whole movement is based upon these two chords. So. This is the needlepoint IV movement of Hedera. I do apologize. This is my, I'm, I'm waiting for a really good video uh, that they shot there. This is literally from my little Zoom camera that I set up um, as sort of a backup so that I could get it soon enough to you. We've got a couple of good cameras and a, and a professional audio recording 
that should be coming uh, this way in not too long. So that's the most, that's the, 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 the wettest ink off my pen. Um, so uh, I have, I, I've spent a long time, um, started out writing acoustic music, spent a long time, several decades doing mostly electroacoustic. And in the last few years, I've sort of reclaimed my acoustic uh, focus and have been doing mostly acoustic music. So it's, it's a wonderful journey, certainly eclectic. And I certainly invite your questions and thoughts. John, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, Jim, it has been an incredible tutorial, really, a journey through the evolution of electronic music and so on. Uh, I've had the pleasure of watching this from a distance. And uh, when, I, when I said at the beginning that your uh, creativity helped put the school of music on the map, I meant that most sincerely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I you know, we have some wonderful colleagues, um, both past and present. Um, and uh, we have we, we have new colleagues now. I mean, uh, you know, in just the last few years, uh, we've added uh, people like Scott Lee and now Tina Talon. Um, wonderful, wonderful young composers that are, you know, certainly uh, the future and in, in, in pushing the program even further for who would have thought, uh, you know, when I came here that we'd have four composition faculty right. and the program continues to grow and we have students 
that graduate with our doctorates that are employed at you know major U.S. universities and throughout the you know the the, the world and go on those that are undergraduate and masters since they go on to the top tier um, you know uh, graduate programs in the United States. So it's 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 certainly been humbling and 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 rewarding to uh, you know to be part of of that and 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 I will say in just the last. Um, just the, the last few years as we've been adding uh, new performance faculty and they're so engaged in doing new music um, and, and, and it's, it, it just you know, bolsters the entire uh, focus on the program, so. Any other Nobody questions any, from anyone? Anybody have any questions like, why the heck did you write that? <laughs> <laughs> you know? I think Richard has a question. Richard, do you have another question? Yeah. No, I have another question. I see that um, there's some Chinese writing uh, and some Korean on yeah. the uh, piece. And the first character is King. And I'm, yeah. I'm a, I just uh, was wanting to know the relationship of these words uh, to the yeah. music um, yeah. as described. Well, in, in, in Korean, uh, that, that, that specific poster is from the Nong Festival, um, which is in, in Seoul, Korea, as part of the um, Korean National U University of Arts, um, which we uh, have had uh, collaborative, uh, you know, works with and have had exchange students. And it's been a wonderful, um, you know, uh, collaboration between uh, the two institutions. Uh, the the character of Nong in this case um, is to play, and so that's that's how that uh, is related. And they they try to uh, put it in in a number of different contexts. I always found it interesting to see that with all the Korean characters uh, and and then English kind of thrown in. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it, you know it it, it just the, the cultures are are, are wonderfully colliding. And and uh, you know uh, they they when I've visited um, the institution they have been such wonderful hosts and I tried to kill me once with kimchi um, but uh, <laughs> uh, it was it was my fault for saying I'll try that and 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 then I couldn't talk for fifteen minutes but uh, um, those of you that have had the the the, the little green dark green beans that they have have uh, fer fermented boy those things will you know, kick, kick, you, kick you in the gut, but it was fun to try. Um, and, and the music exchange, uh, you know, the, 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 I, I can, the great little side story is I went over there for the first time after we had an exchange student, um, Sa Wu Li. Um, and Sa Wu was this, this sort of uh, uh, affable guy, just a, always, always smiling, always just wonderful. And he, he, he would come to his lessons for that semester of exchange. And of course, at that time, I had this thing for having like a Coke and a breakfast bar in the morning. Not a healthy choice, by the way. And um, so when I went to, to visit uh, the first time, he was there to help me move around the subway system and get my recordings for the piece I did called um, um, Bandegi, which is, again, it's a street food. It's a silkworm pupa that they, they use. So he 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 showed up at the hotel and what did he have in his hand a bottle of coca-cola <laughs> <laughs> he, he 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 knew his professor and what he would need it in the morning and uh such such wonderful human beings you know so so in the five minutes or so we have left let's say we were to all gather here 20 30 years from now what kind of music do you think we'll be experiencing then <sighs> What do you see happening in the future? You know, I, I, you know, I like to say, you know, in reference to my first comment about there being two types of music, good and bad. I hope we hear good music, um, and of course, that is that is a personal choice. I hope uh, the, that the music is honest. I think technologically, um, you know, we're going to continue to develop what we're doing. I mean, you saw uh, with the saxophone. If you were looking at the saxophone quartet. Um, uh, the, the alto player was playing from an iPad. 
Okay, he wasn't. He, was, the two of the players had iPads and no music. I do the same thing now. Um, I see more of that sort of interactivity where pieces can actually adapt and potentially the the scores and the, and the notation are are fluid. They're not set so much like like we're used to in in this Western art music tradition, where we write little black dots on a piece of paper. And that becomes sort of the, the sacred scroll for the musician. I think that we're gonna have things uh, as the University of Florida has very much invested in the artificial intelligence. I think we're gonna see that coming into the compositional process where the composer can actually have adaptive scores that change in the need for in, 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 in need of the music. So it's, you know, there's a lot of potential for different directions. Um, will it ever, I mean, I, I'm hoping that there, it, what we're talking about here is not replacement of, but expansion of, right? So that we're not replacing uh, necessarily the, the, the paper music or, or even the, the fixed media work that, that, that I've done in my career, but that we're, we're opening up the possibilities just like Adolf Sachs did in you know, 1853 when the first piece for saxophone was performed. Um, you know, and nobody ever thought that the saxophones would, you know, get rid of the, the, the violins and the, you know, the, the clarinets. It was just a, another way of expressing ourselves musically. So it's really exciting to think about what can, you know, really uh, come in the future. Um, and, and I'm sure with, without a doubt that it'll be things that we don't even imagine at this point, because exactly. in my field, couldn't imagine what we're doing now. 30 years ago. Jim, thank you so much on behalf of all of us who participated in your presentation today. Everyone will meet at the same time next week for the final session in this class, Meet the Composer. And Paul Richards will be joining us again to give us a behind the scenes look at his new opera, The Golem of Prague. Well, thank you, Jim. Thank you all. Keep listening to music. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Dr. Sane. Stay well, everyone.